The, uh, the lesson today that we're going to, I want to focus on in Devarim is uh, of, called Of War and Peace, uh, the futility of trying to achieve peace with someone who's your sworn enemy. Okay, now we're going to see some patterns in here that's going to be interesting. And uh, very much like, um, uh, gosh, I'm trying to think of the producer that does this, very famous for producing movies in which it's not linear, it just sort of bounces back and forth throughout the text. A lot of times in De Devarim we're going to see that. And where it starts off with one text, and then all of a sudden it goes back 40 years, and it comes back, and so it, it can be very confusing if you don't think keep things in order. So I'd like to start off with the first chapter of Devarim, and we're going to start with verse... Three. It says, it was in the 40th year, in the 11th month, and on the first month, when Moshe spoke to the children of Israel according to everything that Hashem commanded them. Okay, so let's picture this. He's standing there, and he's getting ready to give them a, a, a refresher course on everything that was given to him at Mount Sinai. As we are going to know, and we point out that this is a gentle... Uh, a gentle correction, right? It's a very respectful correction that he's going to give them, but he's going to remind them of the Torah, of the lessons that they learned throughout their, their journeys. And then it says, verse 4, After he had smitten Sihon, king of the Amorite, who dwelt in Heshbon, and Og, king of Bashan, who dwelt in Esteroth, in Ezreel, Ezri. On the other side of the Jordan, the land of Moab, Moses began explaining his Torah and saying, Now, here we have him start, but it was only after he conquered the uh, King Og and Sikon that he actually start. Did you, did you have a question? Or are you, wait, okay, I thought you were trying to get my attention, I'm sorry. Uh, it was only after he conquered the land that he began this discourse. Now, I read across in... The Torah anthology, something very interesting. There were four things that uh, are four reasons why Moshe, Moshe waited uh, close to his death to admonish the Israelites for, uh, for, the, the, for four reasons. And I found it quite interesting, and I wanted to review these with you. Number one, if he would have admonished them earlier, the Israelites would have said, it is not enough that he kept us in this terrible desert and did not bring us to the promised land. He did not even kill the two kings, Sichon and Og. All he is doing is making us feel bad and admonishing us. So number one, Moshe waited because he says, if I wait, and they know they have to cross and do and go into battle, here Moshe basically is going to get out of the job, stay on this side, he's brought us in this desert to die, and now he's going to leave us to this enemy that's going to ravish us. The second thing, Moshe, intent was that after he finished giving them this admonishment, he would then explain the Torah to them, as we shall see. Therefore, Moses waited until he killed uh, Sechon and Og, and he wanted the Israelites' minds to be at ease. He didn't want their minds to be worrying about what was on the other side. He wanted them to actually focus on the intent and knowing and studying Torah. Number four, number three, I'm sorry, number three. Uh, Moses wanted to strengthen their hearts and give them courage. He therefore said, See how many times you angered God in the desert, but God reacted with mercy and compassion and love. You should not ask, How will we occupy the land of Israel? It is impossible that we will not sin in some way. Wherever we sin, God will always become angry with us and expel us from the land. Therefore, Moshe wanted, until after he had killed Sichon and Og and took the land, Moses said to them, Look at the mercy and compassion of God. So here, once again, is Moshe's great uh, humility and strength of leadership and character that says, this is what we're going to do. Before going to the land, I'm going to make sure we conquer them so we can prove to them how many times, and you know the admonishments are actually gentle corrections as to what happened and where did they go wrong. And he's going to remind them, in spite of all these things, look what God just did for you. He helped to bring you through victorious in battle. Number four. The Israelites were about to enter into the Holy Land. Moses wanted to warn them not to sin after they come into the Holy Land, since this land was greater than any other lands. 
Every land has various advantages. One land has advantages and the other one does not have. However, the Holy Land uh, was every advantage and lacked nothing. This land, as he's going to remind them, the fruit even blooms earlier than every other country. Uh, it's more abundant. And as we know, when, before Israel became a, a, a nation state again, the, the land was nothing but swamp and, and desert. It's kind of hard to imagine. How can you have swamp and desert the same place? But it was infested m with malaria and mosquitoes, and it was a wasteland. And when Israel became a nation and they began to toil the land, now it's absolutely the most incredible. Uh, I think it's the seventh most prosperous economy in, in, the, in the world. Am I, I think I'm correct about that. I think it's the seventh most prosperous economy in the world. Now, when I read this text, I want, now want us to go to uh, ch verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 24, because we're going we're gonna to go back in time. If I could turn back time. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Okay. Now, what we're going to do, what we're going to do, only a bunch of hippies would know what that is. But anyway. Good job, Cher. Yeah, that's right. Uh, what we're going to do now is picture he's standing on some cliff and he's getting ready to pronounce the great words of Torah and admonishment, but now we're going to go back to the battle that takes place some weeks before this, okay? Now, verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 24, it says, Raise up and Kephthorim, th uh, Thorim, who went out to Kephthor, destroy them, dwell in their place, rise up and across Arnon, Brook, see into the uh, into your hand I have delivered Sion, king of Heshbon, and the Amorite and his land, begin to drive them out and provoke war with them. This day I shall begin to place dread and fear of you on the peoples under the entire heaven. When they hear of your reputation, and they will tremble and be anxious before you. Next verse, he says, I sent messengers from the wilderness, this is Moshe, in Kedemoth to Sichon, king of Eshbon, words of peace, saying, Let me pass through your land, only on the road shall I go. I will not stray to the right or left. You will sell food for me for, my mon uh, for, for money, and I shall eat, and you shall give me water for money, uh, yeah, for money, and I shall drink. Only let me pass through on foot, as the children of Esau who dwelt with Seir did for me, and the Moabites who dwell with Ar, until I cross the Jordan to the land that Hashem our God has given us. But, but Sichon, king of Eshban, was not willing to let them pass through. For Hashem your God hardened his spirit and made his heart stubborn in order to give him the strength of the, of, of the strength, give him your hand like is this in this day. Now let me set this up. God commanded the people to begin the occupation. Correct? Isn't that what God said? Did God tell Moshe to go into the land and strike a peace deal? No. Not one single time. Was, was Moshe acting in contra, con, contrary to the command of God? This is the question I have. And we can sort of examine Israel's current state of affairs, in which they've attempted time after time to make peace with the Sudestinians, the people that dwell in Gaza and other areas, to try to make peace with them with, with no avail. This is a people that are sworn in enemies of the state of Israel. They're anti-Zionist, they're anti-Semitic, you know, uh, anti whatever you want to call them. And they've attempted time after time to make peace. Did you say pseudo Yes. Thank you. I wasn't sure. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, I do. Yeah, right. Okay. I use that for a very good reason. Plus, I'm banned from saying the other word <laughs> on, on, on radio, so I call them pseudo is the best way to describe them. No, I mean, the whole point is, is they're, they're, it's just, a, it's just a, a faux thing. That's it. 
No, yeah, it is a ploy. And now look, who am I to armchair quarterback what Israel should do? Okay, so I'm not here to talk about politics and what Israel should do. I'm just here to point to a place in time and space and history in which Israel was confronted with the same kind of issue. And look at the response and what did they do should tell us what the response should be today. Now, the problem is, is we're living in a society in which we, uh, Israel has a democratic government that has voted in a de democratic process. And because they do not have a king appointed by Hashem, uh, they're worried about being voted out next year. And so they're very concerned about doing what is the most logical and practical thing to do. The issue is this, bottom line, I must say this. Anybody who is your sworn enemy, it is futile to attempt to try to make a peace deal with when they want you dead. There's no peace, there's no, there's no halfway point between you should die and we should live in your land. There's no halfway point. Was Moses who sought peace in a sense of more of a moral, you know, like a, a sense of more morale than, than God who sought war? Was, was Moses more in a, a higher moral state than God because God wanted war and Moses wanted peace? What was going on? Did God agree with Moses' action? And if so, why was Moses not commanded to act according to this from the onset? Why didn't God say, look, just go strike a deal with them. If you do, bypass them. Don't worry about it. That's not what happened. These questions that we're going to, uh, are, are actually better and analyzed by Rabbi uh, Isaac Arbanal and the introductory to, to Deuteronomy. The question is, uh, it, it, namely, if the Almighty said to Moses, up and set out across, see, I give and begin the occupation, engage him in battle, how is it that Moses sent him messengers with an offer of peace, turning the divine commandment on its head? Had Sion answered him, the entire land lies open before you, if you chose your way through it, what would Moses have done? Would he have desist from engaging in battle? Would he have decided to make peace with him and never go to war with him? What was Moses' strategy in the whole thing? What we're going to find out is that Moshe was working clearly within the guidelines of what God gave him. And I'm going to show you how. This would have been done, with, this would have been a crime if Moshe would have ignored not eventually going into battle. So there's, there has to be a reason. Everything in the Torah that, we have, that appears to be, what do you call it, a, a, a contradiction or uh, something that doesn't seem right, it just seems out of place, it's because we haven't fully understood what the process is. And we only get this from the sages. These discussions that I bring today come out of Midrashic sources. Rashi based his commentary on the Midrash, explained that Moshe learned to act as he did from the Holy One, blessed be He. Now, where did we learn this from? It says this, from Rashi's commentary, From the wilderness of Kedemoth, although the omnipresent had not commanded me to make an offer of peace at, uh, at Sichon, to Sichon, I learned to do so from what happened to the wilderness of Sinai from Torah, which existed prior to the world, uh, to the, to the world which is a play on the word of Kedemoth, meaning prior. For when the Holy One, blessed be He, was about to give to Israel, He took it around to Esau and Ishmael, knowing full well that they would not accept it, yet nevertheless He made them an offer of peace. Similarly, I first approached Sichon with the words of peace, another interpretation of the word from the wilderness of Kedemoth. I learned it from you, who were in existence prior, a play on the word of Kedemoth in the world, you could have sent one flash of lightning and burned up Egypt, but instead you sent Pyro, an opportunity to do this thing in peace by saying, let my people go. So clearly Moshe was operating in the guidelines. According to this Midrash, Moshe had commanded outright to engage him, that is, Sechon, in war, 
but he learned from his behavior, the Holy One, blessed be he, himself from the, inc uh, the incidents related to giving the Torah and the exodus from Egypt, that first one must call for peace, and if they do not accept peaceful ways, then one must move on to the next stage of the fight, which actually becomes the prime directed directive of the Israeli army from that day all the way to this day. From the Gaza War, you name it. If anything, Israel has went above and beyond the call of duty to look for a peaceful process instead of going to war. If anybody thinks that an Israeli soldier, soldier in the IDF, is a bloodthirsty warrior and wants to go to war, they're, they're, they're fooling themselves. I don't know of a single soldier, unless they have a mental health issue, wants to go to war. Nobody wants to do it. But at the same time, is there, um, is there, um, oh, what's the word for it, um, a higher level of integrity that before you go to war that you offer some kind of peace deal? I believe it is. The Natsiv's interpretation sharpens the distinction between conquest of the land of Israel and the present case of regarding right passage. It's found in Hamech Devar, Deuteronomy 2.24, it says this, Begin the occupation com coming into the land in order to pass through would be the beginning of the actual occupation. Unlike the case had been with Edom and Moab, had these kings wished. Now, just a reminder, I don't know if you realize, but according to the Midrash, the historical record, uh, King Sichon and Og made war against Moab. And most of the land that they are now going to conquer were land used to belong to the Moabites. Right? This is the reason why God's wanting to continue on saying, go through and clean this out. This is a part, this is part of Moabite territory and land. It says, uh, engage them in war, and if they do not let you pass through, do not hesitate to fight them. But Moshe was not commanded to fight them necessarily at that moment. This is a precise interpretation of the word uh, hitgar, engage, namely an act of challenging, which leads to battle. In truth, it would have been better for Sichon uh, permitted them to pass through the land, and if the land of the seven nations, and if the land of the seven nations, which were more scared, had been conquered first, then the Reubenites and the Gedites would not have settled into the Transjordan. They would have not been exiled first and things would not have turned out as badly for Israel as they had did in the end. So what do we learn? We learn that by making this decision to make peace was also a very strategic move. What were they planning on doing? Well, re realize that before the sin of the spies, God had promised them that all you have to do is go. They're going to run. So literally, before the sin of the spies, they could have went in and conquered the land without one single confrontation. Now that's hard to believe because now they have to go fight tooth and nail to get it. Now, according to this, this uh, Hamech Devar, God did not command the Israelites to enter the battle immediately, but if only there to be given permission to pass through, that is being so Moses' offer peace did not contradict God's command. According to Nachmanides' explanation, Moses sent messengers before God commanded begin the, before he began the occupation, engaging him in war. It says this, See, I give you power, give you, I'm sorry, I give your power, Sichon. This utterance refers to what is said further in verse 31. See, and I begin to place Sichon and his land at your disposal. Prior to that, Moshe sent him messengers from the wilderness of Kedemoth, for he would not have sent an officer of peace saying, let us pass through your country after God had commanded him, beginning the occupation, engaging him in battle, since if he, Sechon, had complied with he, Moshe, would have transgressed the Lord's command. And if he knew that he would not comply, then this offer would have been for naught. So the idea is Moshe pretty much knew, just like a pyro. It's, he's not going to make a deal. Today, when the Israel, Israeli government is asked by our president, to make a peace deal with the Palestinians, uh, they're like, okay, give it a shot. But it isn't going to happen. It's not going to happen. Now, 
I, I, I have more detail that I want to pass on, but I want to hit something I think it's very important at this point. Many of us have, all, all of us have sworn enemy of our, of our life. And it is the, the object of, of the negative forces to cause you to exercise your free will against doing what Hashem wants you to do. Are you following? Everyone has this. It's a sworn enemy. Its duty is to cause you and to force your hand at your free will to do that which your Yetzirah wants you to do, your negative inclination. And whatever it takes, that will work on you until you make that decision. Now, the question is this. Can you afford to make a peace deal with this force of enemy and say, well, maybe I can dance around this. Maybe we can work out a deal to where you won't really tempt me too much. You can't do it, can you? It'll eat you alive. Eat you absolutely alive. And let's look at some examples of some things that could be our Achilles heel, enemies that want to destroy us. Every one of us has enemies that the evil forces of the universe want to use to get you to exercise your Yetzirah, your evil inclination. We mentioned these the other day, and I can't even remember the dialogue behind this. I was talking about self-improvement. Let's say that one has um, a, a drug addiction problem, and that's before they really came to their senses and was able to work out. They have a lot of uh, issues with drugs, and mostly prescription drugs. There's a lot of people who do legal prescription drugs that are, are not good for you. They come to their senses and they realize where that prescription drug problem had brought them. And they realize, I can't do this anymore because if I do, it, it caused me to, to commit too many sins. It caused me to be lazy. It caused me to be indifferent. I didn't want to study Torah. I didn't want to live a righteous life. I didn't want to do mitzvah. And now that I'm doing this, I don't want to ever go back. So I want you to understand that that constant reminder as that you know, you're going to be constantly reminded that you're, uh, you're addicted, you're a drug addict, you always want, so you always have pains here and there. You know, it's going to remind you of all these things. Can you make peace with that or do you have to go out and do battle with it? That's the point. You've got to do battle with it. You've got to crush it. The only way to crush something like this is through an absolute infusion to the knowledge of God in your life. You have to constantly have an, uh, an infusion of the knowledge of God in your life. Now, it can be quite discouraging for a person in the beginning of this process to really receive Torah if they don't first smash those enemies, right? If you don't begin to crush those enemies, it could be hard, just like Moshe was thinking about the children of Israel. Very difficult to teach them the ways of their paths and how they can correct those if they're still worrying about being overtaken by this great enemy. And we can carry on and on. There are a lot of things. We talked about vows last week in which a person could take a vow if, if, and add this prohibition on themselves if it's for self-improvement. We talked about alcohol. We talked about uh, porn addictions to, on the Internet, et cetera, et cetera, that if a person had these issues, they can add extra restrictions on themselves. It's not a problem. Now, we've all learned in last week's lesson, it's better just to not take a vow and just do what you know you need to do to crush that, that enemy. But we all have a sworn enemy of our neshama that wants us to exercise free will to the point that we exercise our yetzahara, our negative inclination, which could cause us to destroy. However, when I say this, I do not mean that you have the ability of destroying your yetzahara. You'll never destroy that because it's a part of who you are, okay? Your negative inclination is actually meant that you serve Hashem with both your good inclination and your negative inclination. That's the, where we get the verse, I serve Hashem with all of our heart, soul, and strength. That's the whole point. But we have to remember what influences our good inclination and negative inclination. It's the either sworn enemy of the soul or a sworn ally to our soul. And that's it. With, if we realize that we cannot make peace with those things, then we must realize it's time to make war against those things. And may Hashem give you strength, may He cause you to go from strength to strength as you discover the things, the enemies of your life, 
and how you are to make war to destroy those things. And that concludes this sure, and we shall go now into the question and answer period.